Good evening, everyone. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Kate Green. I have the pleasure of leading the curatorial department here at Oklahoma Contemporary and of welcoming all of you here tonight. Um, you know very well that for over 30 years, Oklahoma Contemporary has been a vital resource for contemporary art for the region. And of course, this is all about artists. It's all about artists. And so we're thrilled to tonight be here to both celebrate the exhibition featuring three artists from Oklahoma making site-specific work, combining Eastern and Western elements, and really responding to space. And um, I'm thrilled to welcome them here tonight, these three artists and the curator of the exhibition who's going to be in conversation with them. And we'll, of course, leave time for some questions at the end, so please um, save those up. And um, all of this, you know, is not possible without artists, but it's also not possible without our supporters. So I just want to shout out to a few of those, the Ad Astra Foundation, Annie Bohannon, the Chickasaw Nation, Cox Communications, Leslie and Cliff Hudson, the Kennedy family, George Records, Jean Hoffman Smith, Glenna and Richard Tannenbaum, and Velocigo. Thank you to all of those, to our board, and to all of you for being here tonight. We're really, um, we're really so happy to have you. And as you've been sitting here, I'm sure you've been watching. There's a lot happening at Oklahoma Contemporary, a lot of events. So please put those on your radar, and especially. Um, put on your radar the date, March 24th. On March 24th, we celebrate the next exhibition downstairs on our second floor of paintings by John Newsom. They are incredible. They're huge. John will be here with us, um, and so please come back and celebrate that. But tonight, we're here to celebrate the three artists whose exhibition you've seen. And I'm going to welcome to the stage Pablo Barrera, our curator. Thank you so much, Kate. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. So, to begin, welcome, everyone, and good evening. My name is Pablo Barrera, the Associate Curator at Oklahoma Contemporary, and it is my great pleasure to host this program with Sarah Maud, Miriam Rana, and Romy Owens, the artists featured in the exhibition, Off the Wall. For Off the Wall, these artists incorporated painting, sewing, textiles, mixed media, or laser cutting tools to create large-scale immersive installations. Each artist is working off the wall, often involving the viewer through interactive elements. More on this in our conversation, as well as how the artists have found site-responsive artworks just um, that activate the body and the mind useful for commingling these Eastern and Western visual elements. And these artworks gesture toward the many aspects, history, space, people involved in perceiving art. It is therefore fitting that we lead into a land acknowledgement for this talk, because while installation artwork can be seen as a statement on how we relate to space in which the art is situated, a land acknowledgement helps us to appreciate the history of the place where we have the privilege to live, work, and create. We begin by acknowledging that Oklahoma City's complex history contains important stories which go beyond the purview of this talk. Indigenous presence began thousands of years ago, resulting in a state that is now home to 39 recognized tribal nations. Oklahoma Contemporary stands on ancestral lands where the Wichita Nation shared territory in mutual respect with the Comanche and Osage Nations. Later, the Indian Removal Act of 1830 placed this area within land chosen for Muscogee Nation removal to Indian territory. 
1856, the U.S. ratified a treaty promising attractive Muscogee land to the Seminole Nation, an area that cuts across present-day Oklahoma City from the northeast to the southwest. The Muscogee and Seminole Nations would go on to allot land for their black neighbors and relatives, seeding around 60 all-black towns throughout the state. These treaties were betrayed during the post-Civil War Reconstruction era, paving way for what would become known as the land runs prior to statehood. Today, Oklahoma Contemporary is an automobile alley, a stone's throw from the historic Deep Deuce neighborhood, which developed because of segregation ordinances restricting where black residents could live. Remembering this once self-sufficient community is all the more relevant during Black History Month. We are pleased to have with us tonight three Oklahoma artists. Sarah, Romy, Miriam will speak about their work and just a little bit of each artist to begin. Sarah Mott, the over, the Sarah Mott's overlapping geometric figures recall Islamic art making traditions and organic biomorphic patterns. Is that correct? <laughs> the artist forms have been presented at the Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa, the Eisman Center in Dallas, the Los Angeles Center for Digital Art, Akon Art Gallery in New York City, Sharjah Art Museum in the United Arab Emirates, the Cole Gallery in Karachi, Pakistan, and recently, Ahmad's 2021 project, The American Dream, was installed at Oxley Nature Center in Tulsa as part of the Greenwood Art Project. Ahmad is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Tulsa Artist Fellowship. This spring, her work will be featured in the exhibition, Women of the Pandemic, in partnership with the Qatar American Institute of Culture in Washington, D.C., and Qatar Cultural Village Foundation in Doha, Qatar. Romy Owens' forms involving taut, colorful string earned her the role in 2010 as the Paseo Arts Association First Emerging Artist of the Year and the first artist in residence at the Skirvin Hotel in downtown Oklahoma City in 2012. In 2015, Owens completed the Unbearable Absence of Landscapes, a community-building site-specific installation at 108 Contemporary in Tulsa. In 2020, she completed Under Her Wing Was the Universe, a public work in Enid. Owens' next project, Sugar High, opens on April 1st at PJ's in downtown Oklahoma. Or downtown Enid, sorry. Miriam Rana works primarily with bold, colorful, and layered compositions incorporating references to traditional Pakistani ornamentation, architecture, and contemporary street art. In summer 2011, Miriam received the research grant to study traditional Mughal-style miniature painting in Lahore, Pakistan, which we'll talk about a little bit more. This 16th century art form has inspired many of her series since. Rana served as design chair for the TEDx Florida State University and was commissioned by Aramco World Magazine. Her current solo exhibition, The Midnight Garden, is on view at the University of Central Oklahoma Melton Gallery until March 3rd. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Maud, Romeo Owens, and Miriam Rana. One second. There we go. So I want to begin with you, Sarah. Um, also in the order of installation when we're putting everything together. Uh, could you speak to how this work, which as you can see is made of many different fragments, are simultaneously about personal experiences, broader social context, and even universal ideas found in nature? Uh, let's start with the personal perspective that you bring to this work. Um, so this, um, the pieces used in this work are uh, from my earliest works um, with screen carvings. In, uh, the pieces were carved in 2012 and 2013, and that's when I started or returned to art making. And I had these screens carved, and I had great ideas for works with them but uh, I couldn't sort of relate to what I was doing, and I was going through a really traumatic period in life. Uh, the home I built in the US as an immigrant was falling apart, and my life was really broken. Um, and what I did with the pieces was I broke the pieces, the screens, and then cut them all up uh, in, into many shapes. Uh, it was. I think the whole process of cutting up the screens, it, was, uh, it took a lot of courage. It was scary because I didn't know what I was going to be doing with all these pieces lying on my studio floor in this heap. And I, uh, the, I had, the screens were really beautiful as whole pieces. Uh, so I started building with these pieces, and those became my first installations. 
uh, that's how um, the work started. And then when I built these structures from these fa fragments, uh, they were, it, was, it became a process of uh, creating uh, sort of new realities or new formations from broken pieces as a metaphor for uh, rebuilding lives from the rubble of the past or creating a future, envisioning a future from uh, the broken pieces of the past. It represented hope for me. And um, that I, I thought if I could do it in art, I could do it in life. That was uh, how it started, like on a very parallel process to my personal life. But then looking at the work, it was uh, also about resurrecting life from uh, the wreckage of destructive experiences and thinking about how on a personal level, individually, as well as in broader social contexts, how we can rebuild our lives after uh, traumatic experiences and envision new futures uh, on our own terms, I guess. I was thinking of manifesting my own future uh, on a path I didn't know what that would be, and so the work process became part of my life process. That's fantastic. So um, you talk a lot about recollecting, rebuilding, but also reusing uh, the works. And when you reuse something, you are reaching into its significance from the past. Uh, does that speak to broader social concerns that you had while you were thinking about the works in terms of its form or color or even structure? So the re... Uh, yeah, so one thing about the work that you're... I think I'll explain that, that you're talking about reusing the screens that I ca uh, carved in 2012 and 2013. Those were a set of 8 to 10 screens. Mm -hmm. And in, I made 11 different installations, and I sort of set this challenge for myself that they're going to be all made from the same pieces and I won't keep carving new pieces. So I cut them up into new shapes, I repainted them and reassembled them into new structures. And the first, uh, I think the first eight were made within the first six months. And uh, these, I call these leftover pieces because most of those um, became part of a commissioned permanent installation and even that commission permanent installation had pieces that had gone through many installations and lived many lives. And these were random pieces left over from um, you know, different projects. And uh, I, when you invited me to make something with these again, uh, they were in different colors. And I uh, painted them all in red, spray painted them, and uh, just thought that I'm going to repurpose them into yet new formations. So that's, uh, yeah, that's the idea behind the work. And uh, you talked about universal, the personal and universal. So the work is, uh, these are Islamic geometric patterns that um, the screen carvings are. Um, Which is what you mean yeah, by screens. Yeah, right? the screens are made from Islamic geometric patterns that I designed into these screens. And they are part of my cultural heritage. I grew up with them uh, at home, in the architecture around me, the Mughal architecture. The screens are used in architecture. But when I started working with these, what uh, it represented to me was really the soul of the work, because these patterns uh, symbolize uh, oneness of creation and transcendence, they are all made from a circle. In the hundreds of patterns are all created from a circle, which is the symbol of oneness and unity, and it's multiple divisions into polygons, and those are continuously repeated. So the concept is infinity and con in the continuous repetition, uh, and they are used in screens that is uh, a way of uh, representing the spiritual within the material by dissolving or perforating the material surface. So the historically, the way the whole art of Islamic patterns came about, it uh, symbolizes uh, the underlying oneness of creation and transcendence. And that is what I was trying to, I think, reach for in life that transcend the lived traumas and experiences into a space of one's own from where one can uh, create a new life or, um, yeah, all of those things were like working together. 
and the cyclical nature of pattern, the continuous repetition. They, a lot of my works are inspired by patterns in nature. You talked about the bi natural and biomorphic combined with the Islamic geometric patterns because uh, the, the patterns in nature from the human body to the cosmos, they all go through cycles of uh, destruction um, and resurrection. That's uh, cells in our bodies regenerate and celestial bodies are formed from remnants of destruction and um, uh, in nature new habitats form on decaying fragments or uh, elements. So the whole process is part of you know the cycle of um, life and so that's uh, part of like you know the universal I look at it as investigating interconnectedness of creation through a study of patterns because that's how we are all interconnected um, as with our shared humanity. So they are all of those layers that, you know, themes that run through many of my works. That's fantastic. So aside from these layers of meaning associated with these beautiful patterns that kind of like mimic these ideas of the infinite, um, we also see shadow in the work as well. And on select Thursdays, uh, you've, you've involved an interactive component to your work as well. Uh, you will invite visitors to use flashlights to create more additional shadows and to cast light in different angles of the work. Um, you know, just filtering it through this intricate latticework of pattern and meaning. Can you talk about how light and shadow perform in your work? So this, well, we, we have to thank Steve for, you know, <laughs> Working on creating Steve these Blair shadows, yes, uh, he did an amazing job. But the way these shadows are created and what's interesting to me is that the work is created from fragments and the shadows are also in fragments. So we could have used one light source and stretched the shadows across the entire room, but there are multiple sources that focus on segments of the work and the shadows are also fragmented in that sense. And I think it makes the work uh, poetic or tentative or um, sort of uh, not static in a way because when viewers or participants bring flashlights and create their own shadows, then they become, become collaborators in making the work and it's dynamic and their participation. It's also like a, a experience of a personalized experience that they are creating the work, that layer of work. So I think that uh, is that came from uh, one of my other works, Cosmic Wheels, and that was the most exciting part for the audience or the participants or visitors that they were creating patterns and they're ephemeral, they can never be created again. And you discover parts of the work and how they, uh, what shadows can be formed by positioning the light and it's, uh, it's fun and exciting. <laughs> So once again, going first full circle to this idea of yeah. a personal versus universal, uh, where you have the individual perspective and then you have these universal concepts and then the viewer gets to have their own individual experience with yeah. it once again. That's wonderful, thank you, Sarah. And I wanna stick with this theme a little bit longer with Miriam's work, just to kind of talk a bit more about these, uh, the roots of these visual elements and these ideas. Um, your work, Miriam, collapses these South Asian and US geographical locations onto one surface, um, and that you're taking experiences and locations from Pakistan and also from Oklahoma, Florida, New York, where you've lived before. Can you talk about how the Mughal style painting, which is what you were trained in, which is this kind of artwork, um, how does that foster or allow this kind of collapsing on the surface? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, the way that this happened to happen is that I was getting my BFA at Florida State University and I was noticing that in my art history classes they were very Eurocentric and uh, I didn't feel like I had a desire to do portraiture in a realistic way. Um, I was always drawn more to graphic bold colors mm -hmm. and I never knew why that was like I never had analyzed um, myself in that way and so I started to like observe, you know, why is it that I do detailed, intricate uh, drawings? And then I got to kind of like, you know, look at 
a couple of these images and I looked at like the psychedelic art that I was seeing. I was born and raised in Long Island, New York. And so my household was very multicultural um, in that sense. Both my parents are from Lahore, Pakistan, but they came here in the 80s. And well, my dad came here in the 80s. And um, I come uh, to these works with a perspective that is not that I am a Pakistani and that I have experienced these things and I have gone to the Mughal palaces that my father grew up around and like running through. I am once removed from that experience and so uh, I do have to confront how I approach these things. Do I want to stay authentic to a style where uh, only a handful of people or a couple of people know how to do this and they are classically trained in Mughal miniature painting? Or do I take my individual um, perspective where the artists that did these works that were Mughal miniatures, they had one hair from a squirrel's tail on a bamboo brush, on a bamboo, uh, excuse me, straw with string? Or do I use the art supplies I got at Michael's? And <laughs> like those were the conversations I was having with myself. Do I dishonor uh, the fact that not everyone knows how to do this? And do I just continue doing this very tedious, difficult art form? Or do I say the conversations that I feel like I want to say? So I never say that I do Mughal miniature painting. I say I do modern. Um, miniature painting so that I am not taking ownership uh, over something that I do not have a right to necessarily. So my way in using the Mughal miniature style uh, in adapting it, I should say, is in the work that you see closer to the center of that hallway that is yellow and there's a blue dome. So I didn't do works that were made in the same materials, but I used the imagery that um, you so often will see in these miniature paintings of bold colors. Um, I took some of those and I took some of the rich, vibrant, multi-dimensional landscapes that were happening and I made those um, in a way that told a narrative that I was so happy to share. Hmm. And how has living in Oklahoma changed the way that you think about these Islamic forms in your work? So I haven't lived in Oklahoma <laughs> very long. About 2019 is when I moved here, and I live in a small town outside of uh, Tulsa, uh, Tahlequah. So where the Trail of Tears ended, where the capital is of the Cherokee Nation. And so I was really observing um, the pride that the Cherokee people have and should have in the life that they've built around them. In some of my work, there is uh, Cherokee uh, writing, and uh, it's a stop sign that you will see uh, in that panel that is closest to me um, right here. So uh, there is um, Cherokee on that stop sign. And I think that, you know, that is unique to where I live in Oklahoma. And so just the actual landscape, like the aesthetics of it, I was very attracted to how the grass turns just this beautiful gold color when it dies. And I'm from Florida, so uh, <laughs> we don't really have a lot of seasons there. And so uh, I just got very attracted to the earth tones and thinking about how I could relate those and make those shiny and glittery and sparkly um, as opposed to making it feel like a lock of life. So I, um, I think that like uh, Oklahoma brought out an appreciation for uh, just parts of life that I had seen so differently. And prior. colors as well. Yes, and colors. Right. I think I, uh, I make art as an excuse to work with colors. Your work certainly rewards close looking. Um, even though they're so large and they're so expansive, they really do require a, a full engagement. And um, for the installation's uh, interactive component on Select Thursdays, your work will uh, bring in uh, handheld mirrors where viewers can explore it. Uh, what are you hoping that they will do with these mirrors? Uh, what will this achieve, or how would you like them to engage the work? So uh, much like how uh, Sarah's work has 
flashlights that are interactive. My work, like you said, Pablo, is going to have a small mirror. And so um, those are going to be available to guests or if you want to bring a compact mirror to look at the work, you can. And uh, the reason that that was chosen over a cell phone is because we often look at our phones and look through our look at our phones with the objective of taking a picture or checking how we look um, but having a handheld mirror is kind of hope, hoping to have a desire to just see something and almost having control over it but not really uh, having these small happy moments that happen when you look at uh, something and you see things by accident, just like looking at, out of your rearview mirror when you're driving, sometimes the sunset catches you by surprise, and sometimes, um, you know, you see something that catches your eye, but, oh, darn it, I'm driving super fast, so I can't stop and take this picture um, and take my eyes off of the road, but you, it stops you in your tracks, and you're doing something with intentionality, and also it brings back that idea of a miniature being in your hand, so I do art in a lot of different um, sizes. So I've done murals and I've done work like this and I've done miniatures and works that are super small where they're intricate drawings. But what I want to achieve is a, a person standing in front, like uh, the experience of a person standing in front of my work and just enjoying it and it being for them in that moment and them interpreting it the way that they want to um, according to the experiences that they've had. So I very much feel like I want to give my work away to the person who's looking at it so that they can have their own uh, highly specific experience with it. So I do feel shy in over explaining my work because I don't want to overstep someone else's personal experience with it. That brings us back to Sarah's points about the idea of that intensely personal perspective when they engage the artwork. So I like the fact that there's this connection and through line of letting the audience find their moment of engagement, which is simultaneously very, very individual and also very broadly human um, in that sense too. So that's, and I, I love what you said about the miniature being replicated in the mirror. You know, we have such large works based on this style that started very small. That photo that I showed from the Met uh, for that particular painting, it's really just like six inches by five inches or so. So it's like, it looks large on the screen, but it's very tiny. And I like this idea that you can shrink it in your hand and you can hold it and have that intimate moment. So that's a great explanation, thank you. And uh, there's also this ephemeral quality in the work that I think is quite lovely, where it's very, uh, it doesn't, it escapes you. You know, we try to lock things down on our phone, but this is just passing through, kind of like light passing through lattice work. And I think that idea of like something ephemeral is a great you know, segue into Romy, your work. Uh, you have this uh, piece that is, at first glance, looks very structural. It looks very uh, stable, but when you start to realize that everything's in tension, one false move and the whole thing comes down, essentially. So that it's actually quite ephemeral, uh, in a sense, too. So I'd like to talk a little bit about you know, sort of like your work in terms of what can you tell me about this tension uh, between mm -hmm. your work the architecture and the viewer. It's so interesting thinking about tension uh, because it, while it is, I think, probably pretty obvious that there is tension in drawing thread from wall to wall and from hook to hook, there's so many ways in which to think about tension. Uh, there's the tension and then there's the tension. <laughs> um, what I love in thinking about the tension of this work in terms of the architecture is that, you know, it is by design. I studied and spent a lot of time looking at this room and thinking about how to address different architectural components of the space. Um, ultimately, though, what I love about this, this thread and the application of it is that, let me go back huge fan of science fiction. Like, I'm a huge fan of science fiction. And I love the idea of these alternative worlds or creating these alternative spaces or just imagined spaces, imagined possibilities. And so I, one of the things when I look at and think about this work is like, we can all logically understand the thread and the hook and the, the position of it all, but I like to imagine the world in which what this thread is doing is suturing things together. So 
So like this cutout that is in the middle of the wall, like if it weren't for this thread, it would just flop wide open or it would just expand. And the same with the, the roof, the ceiling, this thing, like if this thread weren't holding it together, like what if it would just fly into the fourth floor or these ideas, and, and the converse is true. Like, what if these threads are what are keeping the walls where they are, and if we cut them, then everything just collapses in. Like, I like these science fiction fantasies of how space is altered by it. So I think that the thread and the tension and the architecture can go in lots of different directions in my brain. When I think about it in terms of the viewer, I know nobody here was tempted to touch the thread. Not a single one of you was like, oh, but, but I'm gonna tell you, people love to touch fiber art with the entitlement of a king. Like, <laughs> it is just, uh, I mean, I kinda want Kelsey to give me a hell yeah in the back. <laughs> people are entitled to touch, they feel this entitlement and they feel it with art in general, but fiber art really does seem to get a, a brunt of that. Um, so there's this tension of like, yeah, you can touch it, but you might literally unravel the entire thing. It is simple knots on simple hooks, and a lot of it is one thread that just goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And so there is some tension involved in that, which I really appreciate. Of course, I know people will touch it, and they may destroy it in the process. So. Yeah. Uh, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I think that uh, that's a great segue into the interactive component that you yeah. built into the piece. So this piece will not be touched, hopefully, for a long time. <laughs> but at the end of the exhibition, uh, on the last Thursday night late, on that select Thursday, um, you want people to come back and destroy the work and actually engage it with uh, sharp implements in order to be able to mm -hmm. unravel it, so to speak. Once again, changing its dynamics, changing its composition, changing its relationship to viewer and space. Can you talk a little bit about how that uh, came about? That came about uh, pre-pandemic in 2020. I was in the concept, OVAC's concept exhibition in Tulsa, and I had proposed a specific installation of thread to be presented with scissors. And I did that from learned experience that you present anything on a wall or in any context that is not being strictly monitored and people are gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna pull it, they're gonna break it, they're gonna, they just are. It's just, it's not to heart back to anything else, but it's just the way people are. The, the instant gratification of feeling like you can just do it and they do and then it breaks and so I was like, well, then let's just give them the scissors and let's just see what happens. And I had, through experimentation, when Kelsey and I were in current studio together, there was a stretch of probably two months where I was experimenting with thread and nail and cutting and seeing what it does. And one of the things in graffiti that I really genuinely do love are the drips. I love drips. I love messy. I love that aesthetic. And so it was like, here I'm doing this something that is incredibly organized and tense and does have very calculated moves, what if it's presented with scissors and what happens? And it becomes messy real fast. So at that OVAC exhibition in Tulsa for concept, it was, it was almost a dare. It was like, I made this really beautiful thing. It took me 60 hours to make this thing. I made it, it's like 19 miles of walking, like all of this, you're gonna cut it? And I mean, within an hour. <laughs> It was cut. I mean, I know OVAC is here, and at least Alexa is. I saw, yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. People, like, the, the, the tension involved in that, like, the decision to actively destroy what took me 60 hours to make. And, I, yeah, you know why I'm okay with that? Everything is temporary. Everything is temporary. You're all temporary, we're all temporary, <laughs> hair is temporary, bodies are temporary, all of it is temporary. So it's like, whatever, cut it. Please don't cut it <laughs> until June, but come back because I promise you, that first cut is so satisfying to watch what the thread does and how it unravels and how it, it's, it's a very satisfying experience. 
Wonderful. Uh, pardon the pun, but there is a through line with the other artists as well uh, with relation to this uh, idea of impermanence, this idea of the ephemeral and things that are just temporary. Uh, so there's, there's this like uh, a lot of ideas of impermanence in Eastern uh, philosophies mm -hmm. and, and a lot of uh, sort of Eastern concepts and artistic forms. And one of your series is called the Mandalas mm -hmm. series. And I'm curious, does this relate to an Eastern notion of impermanence, which you've explored in past work, this idea that you want things to come and be temporary? Is this something that's evolved from these concepts? You know, it's really, I'm, I love that you're asking this question, and it is something that I have given thought to very recently. Uh, I started the Mandala series, um, oh gosh, I'm so, I'm so aware of how loud I'm being, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's the Gula Lots. Bye. Hi. <laughs> um, sorry. You know, you see them so infrequently, and then they're here. And, um, I started this, this series. If, if you are familiar with me, you know I went through this process in, in Enid, where I'm from, with this public art. Uh, when it was completed, during the beginning of the pandemic, like, talk about anticlimactic. I was in, a, in the midst of a deep depression. And we're in a pandemic, and there's not a lot to do, and I, I'm feeling very helpless and feeling very alone. And I started this series as a practice of feeling completion and wholesome and everything about what a circle means in terms of the we of everything. And I do like round, and I do like circle, and I do like repetition a lot. It is only recently that I have started to think about it in terms of the fact that I am appropriating another culture's iconography or symbolism or whatever that is. Uh, I, ha I don't have a lot of grief about it because I do feel like I have put my own interpretation and spin on it and I think the work is beautiful and worth creating. It's interesting that I don't really see this in relation to that past the material and the media, um, the, the thread being the common theme, but what I have created out here doesn't feel like that to me. Anyway, that's all, I, sorry. <laughs> Nothing is permanent, everything is impermanent. I'm very much a fan of that uh, philosophy and that way of life and it has been incredibly freeing adopting that as a mantra, as something that I work through because whatever it is, what, however hard it is, whatever you're going through, no matter what it is, it's temporary. Everything is temporary and I, I, I feel a lot of liberation in, in thinking about that and so I feel that way about the art, everything. It's all temporary. Yeah. It's why with the wing, one of the conditions on which the city ultimately said, yeah, you can, can do this, is that they set a time limit on it. It's public art, but it only gets to live for 10 years, and then they're going to tear it down because, heaven forbid, there's a her in the title. So with that, you know what? I'm okay with that. It can only live for 10 years. That's fine. At least it got to live, and everything is temporary, and... I'll probably be dead by then anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Not to belabor the point, but you did use the word mantra <laughs> when you were talking about that particular. Did I? You used the word mantra when ah, talking see, about the See, there it so, is. I mean, yeah. uh, man, white people, we just can't help yeah. it. We cannot think, help it. But I think it speaks to this idea that things are interwoven. You know, this right. brings us back again to Miriam, your work, this idea of like things overlapping, these, these uh, experiences kind of coming together and melding and changing. And back to your work as well, Sarah, this idea that everything just sort of keeps evolving, keeps changing, and you do get to choose um, how that works out. So I do appreciate the way that each of you has taken this interesting through line uh, that's rooted in Eastern concepts, particularly like with these ideas and like Hindi, Islamic, uh, Buddhist uh, ideas, and just push them together in a way that makes sense in an Oklahoma setting. And it's so fascinating to see how this installation medium and this installation art process has allowed you, almost freed you, uh, to do so. So thank you very much for sharing. Thank you very much for talking a bit more about your work. And now that we have a little more context, uh, I'd like to invite the audience to, with any questions that they have, anything they'd like to, to remark upon, something they'd like us to go a little bit more deeper upon. I see the microphones back over there. I see some hands there. I 
had a question that this made me think of. The title is Nothing Can Be Perfect, but it looks like everything is perfectly measured. <laughs> is it, or are there imperfections in it? There are imperfections. There are definitely imperfections. Um, I knew that I was working in a uh, complicated space, in a complicated corner with complicated architectural challenges um, for site-specific installation. And so I knew going into it like, all right, here's the space where I can try and make everything perfect, but it's not perfect and nothing can be perfect. Look at me just talking in these like super declarative sentences like I'm the authority. <laughs> You all may know what perfect is. I have not figured it out yet. It sounds like you're challenging the audience to find the little imperfections that are in there the work are itself. Plenty. Because nothing can be perfect. Um, I have a, I guess, maybe statements or questions for Sarah and Rami. And uh, the first one was, uh, and excuse me if we, if you said this already, but. When I looked at your piece, I thought a lot about blood and like how it maybe pools on the floor and then kind of moves up into these patterns. And it made sense when you said something about trauma. So I was just kind of curious about the color choice. <clears throat> and then uh, for Rami, I was reminded of your, uh, of, of this like physics story where like this, I think this physicist named John Wheeler in the 40s, uh, he called one of his students and said, like, I know why all the particles weigh all the same weight. It's because there's just one particle that makes up the whole universe. It's just moving forward and backwards through time. And that's what, like when you said, um, it's just one string, or it's often just one string, it kind of made me question, like, is that... Like, do you, would you like it to just be one? Would that be like a goal, God, you know? Yes. Or, you know, it just reminds me of like all these theories about theory of everything or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Part of the question, the color. Okay, so um, we discussed that because when I had uh, all these pieces in, um, in different colors and many, most of them were in white at that point from different installations, uh, the red ones uh, have always reminded me, especially the way the patterns are of uh, blood vessels and networks in the human body. And I Googled that and some of the pictures that came up, I think I sent them to you, just looked exactly like these patterns. And so I was thinking of, uh, you know, the way the installation is designed in the middle, this um, piece that extends out, it's uh, the, Iota, Iota, is that how you call it? The biggest blood vessel, it forms the arch and then it extends through the body and splits in these two directions and then, you know, becomes networks of um, blood vessels all over. So I definitely had, uh, was looking at that and it's not that I was trying to replicate it, but uh, th that's what it reminded me of. And the color choice red has always been, uh, you know, even in my early installations, it does reference um, that network of blood vessels and life and uh, death and both the colors for life as well as uh, death. So I guess they are all those things that go into it, the color choices. but. Uh, that being said, red is also a very strong color in um, Islamic or South Asian art uh, or cultural traditions. Uh, so it's um, influenced by that. I don't know if it's influenced by that or not, but that's, uh, yeah, maybe part of it. Great question, Romy. I mean, that, the color is just so beautiful. Um, yes, is the answer. Yeah, I would love that. I would love to have the opportunity and the space to put a bajillion nails in somebody's wall and run it with one entire continuous thread. I am highly suspect that that will ever happen in my lifetime. <laughs> you actually have a question from someone online. 
um, and it is for Sarah, and they would like to know how you started with your first screens. First screens, I was actually that summer, I was in Pakistan, and I am very drawn to the patterns. Uh, this was in 2012, and uh, predates works with screen carvings and Islamic geometric patterns in contemporary art by many artists who've done that. So I, this is a tradition where ha these patterns are hand carved, uh, still are uh, traditionally. And so I designed them and I got them, you know, took them to the place where they carved them. They're uh, carving screens all the time for uh, architecture and, you know, different uh, elements in architecture. And so they, the first ones were hand carved and I brought them back with me. And um, so I then, you know, that's when I was thinking of making work, different works with them. And uh, when I broke them, then I had all these pieces, and then I got some more carved in early 2013, and so those were all the pieces um, that I kept working with, and uh, that's how that's how it started from my trip to Pakistan and just uh, a lot of like time spent with patterns, and then actually deciding to get them carved. So they were all carved in Pakistan. But then you moved from hand carving to laser cutting yeah. ideas. Yeah, because then they were like, uh, uh, they weren't used to carving so many. <laughs> and that was, uh, uh, they didn't even have laser cutters back then. I think it was CNC routers and uh, they, nobody would take on this work. I tried, I was in Memphis and I tried to find places and uh, try to get them carved there, and they said it's too intricate, they, it can be done, and so, uh, yeah, so it was a challenge even finding someone who would take on the carving, but I had the piece hand carved, so there was a sample to show that, yes, it can be done. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, so back then it was just very new and exotic, and all the laser cutting, uh, you know, practices or so art weren't art, yeah. mainstream or laser cutters. There weren't any laser cutters around. So <laughs> so truly art in the age of mechanical reproduction. Yeah, and then <laughs> I, uh, they were, I had many ideas of working with them, but this was, I started my MFA and everyone in Memphis almost like started calling it my pattern and I was just starting art making and didn't want to be restricted to just exploring this one form. Um, so then I moved on to many different media and processes and improvising um, that. And yeah, that was one, one reason why I didn't want to continue working with it. It's not my pattern. That's not the only kind of work I want to make. I've got like a lot more to explore. My question was just for, for Miriam in terms of um, your pieces made me think a lot about architecture because it has like so many architectural figures but also the space and also kind of it reminds me of like tent palaces and this idea of like kind of an impermanent architectural space. I was just wondering like all of the different kind of forms of architecture, like how does architecture kind of inspire you and like kind of figure in? Is it a part of like your process, like thinking about that? So I would say, um, as of late, more than ever before, um, architecture is showing itself in my work. Um, these, so these works were not designed to be shown specifically this way, but these are a reimagining of how they were initially installed, which was um, the linear up and down uh, motion where almost all of it could be seen. So parts of this are meant to be hidden, parts, parts of it are meant to be shown. Um, and so you kind of have to work for some views of it. Uh, what I admire about architecture, and um, much like Sarah, a lot of my work is 
drawing inspiration from uh, the things that I've seen. So what I appreciate about the Jolly, um, like the screens that she's making um, reference to, is that it could be a very permanent and dense kind of um, material, but it can also have like a translucency to it, light can run through it. And um, even with paper, I think about how much paper you've thrown away this year, uh, probably less than most years because of the pandemic, but um, there's, you know, why does this paper get attention and why does another piece of paper get thrown away? So. I do like to think about materials. My daughter, uh, who's one and a half now, shout out to Sophia. She, <laughs> she uh, uses foam blocks. And so sometimes like, you know, I, I'm making something out of foam blocks and she like comes in and I call her Sophia Zilla when she just like smashes it. And I'm like, I was doing something here. So like, it's just a matter of like functionality. So I like architecture in that I think it can tell the story in my work in a very different way um, than other things can. Architecture talks about place and home. There's in that piece that is forming a zigzag um, in the beginning of when you walk in, there is a laundromat. And so I don't think I could allude to a laundromat in such a clear way unless I had actually shown it. So my father used to manage a laundromat in New York City at some point. And so as a kid, I remember doing my summer like workbooks, sitting um, there for hours and sometimes blowing bubbles in the parking lot, going to the McDonald's next door, playing in the uh, ball pit. Uh, and, you know, at that time, Spice Girls were really big. So, you know, I didn't think I'd be talking about Spice Girls right now, but <laughs> here we are. Uh, so we would go to the store next door, get those Spice Girl, like, lollipops, and then it had, like, the sticker inside, and you got to, like, eat it and find out, like, which Spice Girl was inside. Um, so all of those memories are wrapped into the idea of that building. And so I was never really, like super into math when I was in school, but I find myself doing the most math I've ever done in my life making these works. So that's why I appreciate Romy's work so much because there's a lot of thought before you arrive on site. A lot of times I like to do art and then sometimes paint myself out of the corners that I've created. I love to make challenges that I can take myself out of. So the architecture is a way to tell a story without showing people necessarily. I think also it shows scale. So uh, the funnest part and also the most challenging part of making these works was thinking about scale. There's a giant like squid that is the size of a building next to it. So that I think like, you know, something that's really interesting is that these are not photographs. These are paintings. They can be however I want them to be. And so I think that has its challenges and that has its perks for sure, just like animation, you know? I think it's great that you mentioned this relationship to architecture and simultaneously talking about not being able to see all your work. When you came into the building today, you, you commented on how each room feels purposeful, like it's designed for something. And, but if you really think about it, you can never see architecture completely. You're yeah. inside some parts, you're outside some parts, you're never gonna get the whole uh, dimensionality of architecture or the whole experience of architecture in one angle. So I think your work also has resonance with that concept where you can never really get the full picture of what's going on in the places that you're discussing uh, from one particular side or the other. If I can just add like one sentence, I think it all, you know, if this had to be a blurb, it would just be like, I love the uh, dichotomy between organic and inorganic. So I think that that works. I think we had one more question over here. Okay, um, my question is also for Miriam, but you kind of answered it just now. Basically, I was wondering um, if you made, if you created these works with the intention of part of it being unseen, and then like, if so, were you still putting as much detail into the parts that were going to be harder to see, but you, you kind of said that you had originally intended them to be hanging straight up and down? Um. Definitely, uh, that's a great question. So you asked about 
Um, if I had intended for some of these to be seen um, in their entirety. So when I was creating them, I could not see them in their entirety. So no matter where you stand, you can never see the entire piece, just like how Pablo is talking about the architecture. So uh, I've definitely tried all these angles of like standing and like seeing the whole work. Uh, it's very hard to find, these works are 20 feet tall, so it's hard to find a building that is you know, has a ceiling that's 20 feet tall. And uh, these were just rolled up and I was like sitting on top of the work and just working and I would see maybe like nine feet at a time and then finish up and then roll it up and then continue working. So I never knew how everything would relate to each other until I, uh, I completed the work. And so even now I was telling um, Steve Floyd and who's, um, the head of installation here. Um, exhibitions manager. Steve exhibition Blaine. manager, yep. thank you. Yeah, so I was telling him that the way that you've hung this work, uh, the decisions that were made, uh, I feel like you're allowing me to see my work in a way that I had not seen it myself. So uh, initially these were hung like this, and this is just, you know, why do the same thing over and over again? It tr it's time to try something new is the thought behind this. What a great statement on contemporary art, the idea of being able to revisit things and see things we think we're familiar with anew, just all over again. Um, so we're unfortunately out of time. Do we have time for one more? We're good? Yeah, uh, unfortunately we're, we're down to the, to the end over here. Please join me in thanking our artists, uh, Romy, Miriam, and Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> and once again to everybody at home who joined us online and to the people who came here thank you so much for coming and joining us for this night have a good evening and we'll see you in the next one